Fred, the supposed fine-tuning of our universe is a topic that elicits great passions among scientists, philosophers, theologians. Uh, the way I see it, there seems to be three kinds of answers. One is that God did it, and manipulating the various dials to make the universe perfect for human life. The second is, in more recent days, it's very popular, multiple universes are generating all different kinds of uh, values for the constants of physics so that some would be uh, acceptable to life, and we're there, so we would see it. And the third is a challenge of the fine-tuning itself and saying, it looks fine-tuned, but it's really not as fine-tuned as problem is not as big as you think it is, the more we understand, we'll, we'll, we'll realize that, that some ultimate structure is, uh, is, is just the way it, it is, and it's, it's, it's not so fine-tuned as you think. So from your perspective of studying uh, star formation, planetary formation, as well as the, uh, the, the future of the universe, uh, how do you look at fine-tuning? Well, I think the, the million-dollar question in fine-tuning is, what are the allowed versions of laws of physics? So, loosely speaking, you can say that in the 20th century, we figured out what the laws of physics are, mm -hmm. at least in our own universe. And the challenge for the 21st century is to figure out why the laws of physics <laughs> are the way they are. And part of that question, and the part that bears on your, on, your, on your question, is what different versions are allowed? Now, it could be that there is one and only one version of the laws of physics, which is the version that we have in our own universe, in which case we get what we get. But there's another possibility. That would be astonishing, though, if that one way that it had to be and it couldn't be any other way were the one that gave forth life. I mean, the two don't seem like they should have a correlation. So if there is only one and that one generated life, that would be a very strange coincidence, I would think. Well, it certainly would be a coincidence, but since we don't know how to do the odds, we can't actually honestly tell you how big a coincidence <laughs> it is. But it would certainly be astonishing. Many physicists have... Um, consider the possibility that the laws of physics can, in fact, be different from universe to universe. So one easy explained version of that is that the strength of the fundamental forces, gravity, electromagnetism, strong force, and so on, could be either stronger or weaker in different universes. Mm -hmm. And so some would say it's different laws of physics, others would say it's the same laws of physics, but with different constants uh, that, that apply to the relative uh, power of each of, the, uh, each of the factors in the laws. That's right. And there are probably more ways to formulate the laws of physics. There might even be better ways to formulate the laws of physics that we experience and measure and use in our own universe. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that other physicists are working on. Right, right, right. So, so what does that imply for fine tuning? Well, the question is that if the universe can sample all these different versions of the laws of physics, whatever they are, then our own particular universe, which is our own local patch of space time, which is expanding, will have one version of the law, but there can be other regions of space-time, which we can call other universes, that can sample the different versions. So that collection of different universes is often called the multiverse. Mm -hmm. Now, one consequence of the multiverse is that if each different version of the laws of physics is sampled in these different universes, then the fact that we have our laws of physics in our patch becomes sort of obvious. It doesn't really give us any predictive theory of why we are here in the way we are, but it gives us some understanding towards that. So it's sort of like a half a theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, uh, it gives us um, a reason of, for, for explaining what we think are these uh, coincidences, but it doesn't take you to a way that you can make a next step from that. What, yeah, you can't therefore, make... Therefore what? Yeah, what follows from that? So the problem is that we can't make definitive predictions. Um, for one thing, we don't actually know how to um, sample the various versions of laws of physics that could be. And even if we could, we can't go to the other universes to see if what we predict <laughs> right, is correct. Right. So we're kind of, we're kind of stuck in, in measuring experimentally mm -hmm. this question of fine tuning. But we can answer some questions. So one example you can ask is, how much do I have to vary the laws of physics and still have stars. Right, right. So That's an important question. It's an important question, because stars, I think, are fundamental to generating right. energy, and they're a first step on the way to life. Yeah. Certainly not all you need, right. but it's a first step. So let's do the simplest possible experiment, where I vary the gravitational constant, the strength of the electromagnetic force, and a combination of the nuclear forces that gives me the nuclear fusion rate in stars. Right, right. So I have a three-parameter parameter space, and I can ask, how large a parameter space does that allow for stars to exist? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And by a star, I mean a stable, long-lived nuclear burning structure, yeah, more or less like the sun. Yeah. And 
The answer is that you can vary those constants of nature by many orders of magnitude and still have stars. So stars are not that special. Now, if you want a more definitive answer as to how large the parameter space is, it depends on how you measure what the allowed parameter space is. And so when, you, when you're varying multiple at the same time, some can go in opposite directions so that the, the combination becomes a, a successful... A uh, successful universe uh, for yeah, producing stars. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, whereas yeah. If, you, if you just did one by itself, then maybe the, the boundaries would be tighter because you're not allowing the flexibility on another. The two can work together. Is that right? That's correct, yes. So you have to consider the whole volume of, right. of parameter space right. and ask how large it is. Right. So if you know what measure to put on the parameter space, you can ask what fraction of universes would have stars. Right. If you use a logarithmic scale, then the answer is about a fourth. Ah. So yeah. it's not a small number, yeah. but it's not guaranteed either. Right. Now to um, be specific, that's just the part of parameter space that allows for long-lived, stable right, nuclear that, that's, burning. That's one, that's step, one step in, in, in a step that may have 10 or 20. It doesn't have a thousand right. steps. And but if you put enough constraints on the system, then you will get back to our universe, right? <laughs> Just like if I take all of humanity, there's what, seven, eight billion of us here. If I put four or five constraints on them, I'll get back to you, yeah, right? right? And so what's the implication of that for fine tuning? Well, it's unclear. It means that there are a lot of possibilities for the way stars and other astrophysical structures could exist in different universes with different mm -hmm. laws of physics. And we're just now exploring all of those possibilities. So there's a lot of work left to be done.